Welcome back to Water Finance and Management Conversations. I'm your host, Andrew Farr, Managing Editor of Water Finance and Management. On today's episode, we're going to follow up on a conversation we had with Greg Heron of Bentley Systems earlier this year, discuss a couple more points related to the digitalization of water and wastewater systems really across the globe and how utilities are using digital twins to improve operational efficiency. And to help me do that, I have another great guest from Bentley Systems joining me, Cecilia Correa, Senior Water Solutions Manager, joining me all the way from Lisbon, Portugal. So Cecilia, it's it's great to have you with us today. Thanks for taking some time. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be with you. So Cecilia, I, I think a great place for us to start uh, would just be to, to ask you if you could Talk a little bit about what you're seeing in in the the water market in in Portugal or or perhaps in, in Europe in general, and and compare that to what you're seeing in the U.S. market. What are some of the the similarities, some of the differences as far as the, the you know just the the water challenges and 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 in the the realm of of technology adoption? Maybe that's a that's a, a good place for us to start. Well, I see a lot of similarities between what happens in the US and in Europe in terms of adopting digital uh, uh, solutions. I would say that the biggest difference would be in terms of dimension. So you would have state, cities, utilities in the US which are adopting exactly the same measures as other cities around the world, uh, in, like in Europe. But you will all see, also see others who are not adopting uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, solutions, but it also happens uh, um, in Europe. Another different similarity has to do with regulation and legislation. And I think, again, it's the same. So not all the states have the same legislation. And in Europe, there is a kind of a common framework for legislation, but then each country adopts a, a different uh, kind of approach in towards this. But I see the same concerns, whether you are in the US or if you are in Europe, for example, water losses. This is something that you know affects everyone, but maybe the pusher is a little bit different depending on the country that you are and the availability of water that you have, the infrastructure, how old it is, you know, how much water you have available. So I think those would be the most uh, differences. Is technology and software such as a digital twin used more for design and engineering purposes or has it evolved into more of a uh, operational decision-making tool? Um, has that changed or evolved in, in recent years? Well, uh, when we think about a digital twin, it starts with the definition of a digital twin. So the digital twin is a representation of a real system. So if you're talking about water supply, although the, the design phase will be upstream, that operational uh, stage, um, you will see that this is more adopted by the, the, the operators by a utility. However, I think the first adopters were actually the engineers in the design phase. Because if you think a couple of years ago, when you start doing a design for a utility, for example, you would do an hydraulic simulation. You would start by thinking about what would be the pattern. You think about history, looking at data, trying to simulate future solutions. But the fact is that it has evolved. So today, the utilities, they have sensors for measuring the flow, for measuring pressure. And what happened was that, you know, the hydraulic model was actually developing in that way, in a way that when you were doing the hydraulic simulation, instead of using kind of supposing things, you were actually bringing in the information. And then you had the information of the tank. So you would gather that information. Then you needed information from a pump station. And today you have everything available. So although I would say that it were the hydraulic uh, engineers who have started, today it makes sense to be operational in real time for the, the utilities. So it would be the utilities to be using the digital twins today. What is the best way for a water utility, perhaps a smaller mid-sized system with less resources, uh, what's the best way for them to go about adopting new technology and, and start implementing these, these tools? 
I think there is room for every type of utility to adopt this uh, type of solutions. However, I mean, we all know that we all like to be on our comfort zone, right? So to get out of that comfort zone is the hardest part. So I would say that the, the hardest part will be the mindset. So, you know, leaving that mindset that, you know, I have done always things this way, you can do better, you can do differently, you can do faster. You, you're just making use of what you already have. Even if you talk about a smaller utility or a very big utility, they can also have the same challenge, right? But if you think of a smaller utility, they already have digital data. So it all starts with bringing your data together and making the best of that. So I would say that the first thing is people. People are, you know, the main, uh, um, the, the most important to be actually adopting this type of, of, of solutions. So they are, of course, key people to advance on the digitalization process to achieve these, these, these common goals. But I mean, the utility needs, needs to have a vision. And after they have this vision, then to implement, I would say that any utility can do that. For example, imagine a utility who has, a, a, I mean, that doesn't have a lot of uh, water. So we all hear about water scarcity, right? Or we all hear about the energy, you know, the cost of energy today. And people maybe don't relate these two, but actually for you to have clean water, you need to treat it. You need to clean it. You need to transport. All of this costs money, costs energy. So if you're losing, for example, water in your system, I mean, does it make sense that you go and intake more water that you don't have, or should you just treat that water that you're losing, right? So, and that goes to small, medium, and big utilities. So if they establish as a goal to reduce non-revenue water, for example, to bring in all the data that, that they have and to interrelate them, then they will be able to do a lot with just a little bit, right? And I mean, that's why we have, we're also in this world of digi the digital twins, because we want people to be the utilities to uh, afford this type of technology and not having to go through a process where they have to develop everything in-house. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned energy reduction. That's obviously a huge consideration for, for utilities both on the drinking water and wastewater side, uh, specifically in the, in the treatment process. Um, so, so any way that they can uh, reduce energy usage, and you know that's a significant cost consideration right there. You also mentioned simulating future uh, scenarios a little bit earlier, which is something that I, I also wanted to ask you about uh, in in my final question, um, which is the predictive analytics capabilities of, of digital twin. Can you give us some examples of how utilities might use a digital twin tool in such a way and, and, and the ability to run these what if scenarios as they're, as they're sometimes called, what benefits are there to the utility? And uh, can you give us a couple of, uh, of examples? I mean, predictive analytics and the ability to run what if scenarios and, um, can benefit the utilities in, of course, many ways. I mean, the digital twin can have several components, can have real-time modeling, but it can only have, you know, monitoring. But even if it has only monitoring in place, you can, you're monitoring basically your flows, your pressure. So when you realize that you have a big consumption of, of flow, but, you know, that the, the pressure has reduced a lot, that will give you a, a clear indication that you have a pipe break. So you can actually act very fast and that allows you to, you know, reduce the time of, of, of repairing uh, that. It also means that you will not spend so much money in, on, on the water, the volumes that you're losing. On the other hand, also in terms of energy, the cost that you, you, you have to, to clean that water. But on the other hand, if you can also predict and we have some real-time uh, uh, modeling tools, using our hydraulic model where you can actually run what if scenarios, kind of what if I have a pipe break here? Or what if, you know, I don't have enough pressure? If I have to replace a pipe, for example, even if it's not a pipe break, like I need, to, even if it's maintenance work, right? I need to repair uh, uh, or replace a pipe, then you can 
run some what if scenarios, understand what roles you need to, you should close, and also who would be affected by that. So you could actually, you know, change the, the, the root of the, of the water. You could actually do it differently by changing other type of valves and among other type of scenarios that you can look at it. So, I mean, that means a lot of savings. And we're not even talking about, you know, all the analytics that you can actually uh, do. In terms of examples, um, we have been implementing in a couple of years some uh, digital twins. For example, in Porto City, I'm in Lisbon, so in Porto, you may all know the wine, Porto wine. <laughs> so in Porto City, they were able to reduce the service interruptions by 42%. And I mean, this is something that they implemented the, the, the digital twin and their goal was not to, you know, reduce this. Their goal was to integrate data, to uh, have data available across uh, uh, the utility to become more digital and make more use of it. But then the results come as a result of being having all the information integrated. If I look at other type uh, uh, of examples, for example, the, in, in the US, DC Water recently, they turned to open flows water site, a digital twin to make the data and analytics more visible you know, across all the enterprise and to reduce operational and capital expenditures um, and therefore also reduce non-revenue water visit, which is something that we have been hearing more. And we, I guess we will hear more about that because of the pressure in the cities, because of the lack of, of, of water and climate change, I'm not gonna discuss you know, the climate change, but because things are really changing, then we need to be more aware of that. I can also give other examples, for example, Manila water in the Philippines. And this is to give, you know, it's not just Europe and the US, this is also happening in other parts of, of the world. So Manila Water, they had several challenges like high levels of water losses, aging networks, high pipe break a, uh, rate, and they were able to reduce on build uh, uh, water losses by 25%. I mean, in terms of money, this is a lot of, of money, of course. Well, Cecilia, it's been great talking with you for a few minutes today. Uh, thanks for all of your great insight, and hopefully we'll be able to get together soon and, and talk a little bit more. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And we'll have to leave it right there. Thanks for watching another edition of Water Finance Management Conversations. We'll see you next time. Thank you.